Yeah, so today I'm going to, this is the ENDO meeting. It is Wednesday, June 21. Just for those who are curious, I say these things because it makes it easier to manage the documents when I'm putting them in the right place. <laughs> All I have to do is listen to the first five seconds and re and then name the file. <laughs> um, but the uh, uh, topic for today at the EndoSync is, uh, I, in the absence of more pressing topics, um, the Endo Pet Demon progress report for the week. And as of yesterday, I have inboxes and outboxes reified, um, and you can interact with them at the command line. And uh, what this means, uh, as I was explaining off, off uh, in, in the preamble to the call, an inbox is an inbox and an outbox are an entangled pair of objects. The inbox is the part that uh, that you uh, that a user would hold in order to grant or deny access to powers that are requested by the party holding the outbox. And they both, the inbox and the outbox, have separate um, key value stores from name to value or formula for constructing that value internally. Um, and uh, those stores participate in the, the garbage collection graph for all of the things that get persisted by the demon. Um, and the the key to the and, and the reason why I think it's important that we get to this particular milestone is because I think that the inbox outbox dual is the primitive that I need in order to branch out in two separate directions from here, one of which is building a user interface uh, or really uh, the, the multiple directions starting from here because it, you would you would create an inbox outbox pair or new outboxes for the inbox that the user's holding um, in order to give a confined application the ability to ask for more power or give a web interface the ability to ask for uh, external powers or give an outbox to a peer, a friend, whatever, on in your in your peer-to-peer -peer graph so that they can ask you for powers or send you messages. At the moment, it just has request. I expect to eventually need to add a send method um, and that would basically give you everything you need to do peer-to-peer -peer chat, chat um, and make edge names a real thing, etc. cetera. Um, for the peer-to-peer -peer case, there's probably going to be an adapter that needs to be made in order to confuse the names on the wire, but that's another story. Um, the, but yeah, so that's where I am and I can start showing this at the command line uh, unless there are questions. All right, let's do a thing. I think this is the one. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to reset Endo. This is basically taking Endo back to factory defaults. Um, on my left window, this is the um, tracking that all of the state that's persisted by Endo in the user's home directory um, over here. Question: um, mm. That 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 CLI prompt is that? Are, are you are you actually talking directly to Bash? Or are you talking to a CLI program that you have written? I'm running in Bash. Yeah. So these are these are executing as 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 shell commands. Yes, these are shell commands. The shell CLI command... is the directory name. He's in the Endo CLI directory. Yeah, this is in the Endo repository. Okay. Uh, here we are. <laughs> just to orient, yeah, just to orient ourselves, and uh, just to, oh, oh, right, it's an alias. Whatever, it's been it, it's been Endo in here, um, and oop, too much information. I need to trim that down. In any case, uh, Endo or or create a subcommand hierarchy, uh, more likely. The okay, so Endo can do things like. Uh, I can say I've got a hello text file. I can say endo store hello.txt and give it the name hello. And now I can do endo list. And it says that, hey, I have a thing pet named endo or pet named hello, which I can then say I want to look at that or look at what it actually is, which is an alleged readable file with this SHA-512. And it's in the content of the store. Uh, it is, by storing it, I've placed it in the data section of the persisted state of 
the endo home directory. Um, and then I can do things like eval, e hello, uh, and then I want to get a stream. And base64 streams go over the wire because we can't currently marshal uint8 arrays. And I'm going to call that the hello stream. I'm going to use, oh, hello. I'll write it. <laughs> it needs hello. This is this is me granting it the granting it uh, the granting the confined program access to the hello pet name, giving it the name hello, uh, just to so show that this is a I'm going to say readable. I'm going to give the program a variable named readable that is bound to the value of the pet name hello, and then I get an async iterator. And then I can follow an async iterator and decode it. So, um, oh, and then if you do that again, because async iterators are expendable, it gets thrown away. It is a happy accident that if you restart Endo, it starts over from the beginning of time, but that's not important right now. What is important is that now I have a couple is, of pet is, names. Is that in fact an, an, a happy accident or is that a bug? It's a it's a happy accident. Um because the the uh the 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 hello thing itself, which is the, the blob of text, uh has no has no dynamic state, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the stream does. Um, and so if you reset them both, one resets to the start of the stream and the other one resets to being the thing that it always was. Yeah. It feels like a strange asymmetry. To me. It is. Um, and it's a uh, part and parcel for the compromise of this particular design. Um, the idea with the pet demon is to give us a place to stand on which we can build orthogonal persistence, which would not have this weakness. Um, but it also puts us in a position where the user can forget something. For example, endo remove, hello stream. Um, and now it doesn't ever have to, when, when I restart it, it doesn't have to, but like I, that, ed, that and all of the formulas necessary to construct it can be garbage collected. Um, and uh, this, this makes it so that we can make choices in our manually persisted confined programs about uh, which, which objects do we care to preserve across restarts and which ones do we, um, and which ones are we okay with being ephemeral. Um, so, uh, so for example, if you were building orthogonal persistence on top of this, an endo worker would run a swing set within it. And it, one of the first things it would do would be to request a persisted, a durable, if you will, um, uh, uh, reference to some storage that it would be uh, uh, some, some mutable storage that it could uh, restore its state from next time it restarts. Um, it, it strikes me that there is, I, I had been thinking in terms of things are either durable or ephemeral, but there's, what you've got here is sort of an intermediate between the two. Yeah, exactly. Because it, it struck me that you could you at at that point where you created hello stream, if there was some additional command line option or something that explicitly marked it as ephemeral, so that when you reset, it would just not be in the in the reset state of the world. Um, um, but if you had a world in which things were durable, it would remember what state the stream was in, namely at the end of the stream after you had read it. Mm -hmm. um, and what you've got here is is sort of in between the two. And, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> which is part and parcel for the compromise. Um, the is on the web. Uh, this is more consistent with what you would get with a service worker or something like that on the web, where the the supervisor is at a in a position where it can make decisions about whether to nuke it, whether to nuke your worker anytime it wants, 
and then bring it back on demand. Um, and and that that's so that's kind of where we're starting here. Um, the reason for starting here, as opposed to doing orthogonal persistence all the way from top to bottom, is uh, that this allows us to build something easier first. Um, and uh, like this is this is pretty consistent with the execution environment that uh, MetaMask would need in order to run uh, a snap outside of the browser that we can establish a persistent connection between the MetaMask party on inside of the extension and its various its constituent snaps that are running inside of the endo executor. And because we're able to persist some of these formulas, it's possible for the endo daemon to restart or for the MetaMask extension to connect and reconnect um, and, have, and have some of those capabilities the, have the powerful capabilities that have been granted by the re user restored between those uh, over that connection uh, without having to harass the user to give them permission every single time. Um, I think where it differs though, your uh, exam, your comparison with service workers that if you have something exported by a program that gets terminated, uh, that thing that gets exported is uh, gets severed and that reference is no longer useful. Where here it seemed when you were started, the yellow stream uh, really was like a heap capability that somehow still exists after the restart. It's not so much that it still exists, it's that um, each of these files over here in the formulas directory captures um, captures the instructions for reconstructing it based off of the based off of the interactions that were uh, that were previously it replays the dag of interactions necessary in order to generate a fresh reference but how do you like how do you know that there is like so does it replay every uh if, if you consider that that's being played in the VAT, do you replay every delivery to that VAT, or do you replay all the ones that are linked to that uh, to that reference? There's no, there's no. Uh, it it's literally a DAG of evaluations in this particular case. Uh, evaluate commands, each of which runs in a separate compartment, and it's not it's not so much of a VAT model as just replaying the instructions that were necessary to construct all the intermediate references. I see. So because you have a compartment created each time, you know there is no persistent global state in between uh, each of those things because you have to endow each, uh, you have to endow the global states. Yes. And so you can rely on only these evaluations being necessary to recreate. Mm hmm Yeah. Huh. Which means that it which means that any intermediate uh intermediate messages that would have to be replayed in the case of a VAT um can be garbage collected instead of instead of having to persist a log. So Why not go all the way and somehow, if you do a second and do follow uh, hello stream without a restart, uh, just reevaluate everything needed to get there uh, instead of relying on some heap state still. Okay. Okay. If you don't restart, the hello stream is is going to reference the object that's in the in that compartment that you still have running. Uh, so follow modify the state of hello stream. Like I, I'm wondering if like you have an opportunity there to almost go like purely functional, basically, or equivalent of functional programming there. Yeah, if, if every object were pure, yeah, <laughs> you, you could get there um, and force all interactions to be monadic, etc. Uh, yeah, this is, like I said, this is somewhere in between. Um, it's 
uh, it's a it's a different compromise. And uh, I invite you to join me in evaluating whether it's one worth engaging in. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of an uncanny valley. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, this is this is the formula that was retained by the command. You'll notice that it doesn't have any pet names in it. The pet names are ephemeral. These uh, identifiers are persisted. Um, and in this case, they're crypto random 512, 512 bit numbers. Um, the, I have erased UUIDs from existence on Brian's suggestion. <laughs> um, they were always intended to be a placeholder for this anyway. Wait, uh, I was distracted. How'd you get rid of UUIDs? I'm using crypto random instead. Oh, it's yeah. Did they get shorter or longer? Longer. Yeah, they got longer. UIDs have have internal structure, which gives the illusion of meaning. Which is yeah. The the reason Brian suggested it is because UUIDs do not receive the same um respect from crypto people <laughs> and as a consequence crypto people are less likely to complain when something happens like hey i reinstantiated this vm and because it had some persistent random state inside of its memory somewhere it gave me the same uuid again um and crypto random is patrolled more vigorously by people who care about the invariant of uniqueness um and uh and insist that even if you were to take the same uh, virtual machine image and run it twice, that you will get disjoint crypto random streams. Um, in any case, that's the rationale. Uh, and because and at, at the moment, I'm sort of going on the on the on the conceit that if 256 bits of uniqueness are sufficient for every Git repository in the universe. Well, surely 512 <laughs> is sufficient for this. Uh, and, and to be clear, these are encapsulated to the, the to the host machine. These aren't communicated to the wire. So there isn't any, uh, and, and, and that is something that has settled in the design since we last spoke is that these are not going to be shared on the wire. So 512 is probably overkill. Uh, by, the, by the way, I just, the, uh, the problem with the Git uh, hashes is not their length, it's, it's that they're still stuck with a bad hashing algorithm. Um, so in any case, they are not a precedent of something that is adequate. Yeah, so I doubled it just, <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping that it's enough. <laughs> what, 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 uh, you're also, these are genuinely, these are, these are just random, they're not the result of a cryptographic hash. Yes, with the exception of the SHA-512 that's used for the content address store, which we will see again shortly. Um, I am going to continue uh, to get get uh, higher up and deeper into this demo. Uh, uh, some things that you may have seen before, though. Okay, the first, the let's let's start with um, this counter example. <laughs> Mark Mark's classic counter example. <laughs> what I'm going to do. By, by the way, your your text is um, at least on my screen is strangely low contrast. I don't know if that's something you can address from your end. Uh, it's something that I have that feedback I've received before and requires me to reconfigure my editor with different syntax highlighting. And... Okay, I can, I can read it fine. <laughs> my my hope is that I I use this scheme because it's gentle on my eyes um, and it, it's not really intended for presentation. But here we are. Go uh, back and forth and show them that the low contrast window is actually the one that's not focused. Oh yeah, there was that too. The contrast. Oh, shift. oh nice. Yeah. Um. So what I'm going to do is. Uh, I'm going to bundle the counter example and give it the name counter bundle. Endo show counter bundle. Endo cat counter bundle pipe xxd shows us that we have uh, a zip file that contain. Uh, oh no, this is actually the base64 encoded JSON in any case, which contains the zip file. Um, and what uh and now i'm going to import bundle 
um, counter bun uh, counter bundle. I'm going really to mean import bundle zero, or is that a typo? The zero is intentional because um, because the zero is my hedge against the possibility that I'm going to change it, and that's probably I know I'm going to change all of this. So there is so <laughs> it's perhaps an overwrought conceit, but uh, import bundle zero for now, and it calls uh, and that uh, and if you look at counter.js again, the convention is now that it must that the the application needs to implement a provide function tentatively provide zero <laughs> so i can version it or just rename it someday <laughs> and um the uh and it's supposed to provide a fire reference for the things api um so now we're going to do that we're going to say Im, uh, import bundle that looked like a maker not a provider but it will yeah could call it make yeah anyway uh yeah valid um yeah you're aware that we're using the term provide elsewhere for a particular calling convention or a particular convention uh that is, does not correspond to this yeah approximately i i use provide elsewhere in the way that we mean in general and provide is how you get this out in any case but yes the name name can be revised Okay, I mean, th this provide will create a new one every time you call it. Uh, and it's only going to be called once in the context of providing the API of the extension. So it might but, be valid. Okay, no, well, but the function itself is a function that will create a new one every time it's called. Yes, yes. So perhaps make. Make might be the right one. Okay. Um, Michael Figgin have been going back on and forth on it. We decided that main was the wrong name because that's reversed, that we intend to reserve that for something else. Make might be the right word. Um, so it's a counter bundle. I'm going to give it counter powers, and this is going to implicitly create an outbox named counter powers, and I'll show you that. Um, and I'm going to result uh, name the result counter. Uh, oh, and when is that result? I guess that, that's not the outbox, right? Um, so endo show counter powers is creating an outbox. Yeah, endo list. Uh, the side effect of that command was that it created both the counter and the counter powers using the counter bundle. Um, operation that summoned a thing named counter powers into existence it did it did because it's just too darned inconvenient to actually call yeah. endo make out box every single time I wanted uh, to be clear on what you were doing that's all yeah I mean. for example this is something you can do uh you can you can do that first if you wish uh and endo okay so endo show counter uh, i've shown you that endo eval well let's do endo spawn to make something explicit we're creating a worker named uh, worker one i'm going to be able to reuse that from for eval and worker one um i'm going to say e counter anchor counter I'm not going to name the result because I don't care. And this is yet again showing the uncanniness of persistent state. The counter has the counter instance has persistent state up to a point. Uh, but the formula needed to get there is replayed. Okay. Um uh, counter powers um, shows you that now a new new trick is I can say uh, endo list the uh, list shows you all of the keys in a pet name store or formula name store if you will um, and I can designate the endo uh, or the counter powers as an alternate inbox and behold it contains no names um let me show you another one uh 
Chris, would you mind having open up uh, like your directory on the left side? Uh, yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yep. yep. Thanks. Getting a little weedy. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, specifically, um, yeah, we got some import bundle formulas and eval formula. We're still storing a couple of things. That's our Unix domain socket. And then these are worker logs. Um, we've accumulated some because I've been lazy and not reused a worker in a while. Um, workers are created as necessary by import bundle commands as well. Um, so uh, let's see, please. OK, so what, what are, I'm going to demonstrate here is the semi-durability feature of an outbox. Powers is the outbox. In this case, and I'm going to say this program is going to, so this program is receiving an outbox from me, the user, with which it can request uh, an additional capability. In this case, I'm going to, it's going to ask for a counter so that it can produce a counter that doubles every number. Um, and to do that, I'm going to do endo bundle double dot j uh, uh, doubler as double bundle endo import bundle double bundle with uh, import bundle zero doubler bundle doubler powers. That's going to create a new outbox for the doubler and create a new doubler instance. Oop. Known pet name. I'm sorry, my screen's obscured. Doubler Just, bundle. You didn't use an oh. R when you bundled. Yeah, there, thank you. OK, so now I have a doubler. And that means that I can endo eval and reuse worker one. Uh, doubler inker uh oh wait that's gonna uh that's going to wait a long time i don't want i want to do some preparation first behold uh my inbox <laughs> i have an inbox now that is reified and has commands okay so what this means is that the outbox named doubler powers has sent me a request please give me a counter and the request is numbered incrementally zero, which means that I can now resolve, uh, endo resolve request zero with the counter, uh, right? And now when I do, now that, that, has that has granted the doubler access to my counter. Uh, endo inbox should be empty now, endo, uh, you can also reject for what it's worth. That's the other the other half of that puzzle. Um, endo eval. Let me just uh, check. The, the resolve is a genuine resolve in the promise sense, in the sense that the um, thing you're resolving it to um, might be another promise or might be a rejected promise. Yes. Yes, okay. it is. OK. Um, yes. And uh, worker one, and I'm going to eval e doubler e. Let's do it the fun way. This is just the program. I'm going to give it a counter named doubler. That should do the trick. 10, 12, 14. If I do it with the counter underneath it, we see it from slightly farther back. Etc. Okay, so that's that's what it looks like for a confined program potentially in the future up here to request access to a power and interact with the user. Um, and inbox is the command you use to uh, to to look at uh, your pending requests, and the outbox is the object that you grant to the the, the your other party. Um, just for purposes of showing off, um, you can create a new inbox. Um, and in order to, I don't know, partition your requests if you want. Uh, other inbox. 
and go list. I can say, okay, so now my the user's root inbox now contains another inbox pet named other inbox. With me so far? This is about to get recursive. <laughs> I can now say, uh, I want to make an inbox in the inbox named other inbox called yet another inbox. And then endo list in other inbox will show that I have yet another inbox inside of the inbox, et cetera, et cetera. This. And then I can do make inbox I other inbox yet another inbox yet another another inbox when you're when endo's listening to these inboxes like the endo inbox command is there a way to specify you know which inbox okay uh, you have a typo at the beginning of that line you said endy thank you and Furthermore, you can follow. Okay. Um, which will wait for pending requests to come in. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to say endo uh, make out box named. Um, uh, let's let's make make out box fake out box. Do I want to do that? No, right. I need to do that in the context of other inbox. Yet another inbox. Yet another, another inbox. I'm asking for trouble. I'm going to do this a little bit more. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start at the base case <laughs> for this particular one. Um, fake inbox. Make a uh, fake, fake out box. Mm. Inbox. Wait, I'm making a fake out box. Crap. I have a fake inbox. Endo list. <laughs> what do I have? Uh, Other inbox? Yeah, so I have other inbox at the base layer. So I'm going to do endo, endo, endo follow, and endo inbox dash f other inbox. Where's the i? I dash i means inbox. I is specifying a pet named inbox to use. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and then over here, I can say make out box using other inbox as the base and call that fake out box. Oh, what? Uh, oh, right, I'm in the wrong directory. Two questions when you're ready. Yeah, let me, let me get to the other, get to the end of this line of thought because it's fragile. Uh, okay, so now I've created an outbox that's rooted in the inbox that I'm already listening to, and in there I can fake the interaction that my program was doing by making a request starting at other inbox, fake outbox, uh, a number from 1 to 10. Please work. <gasps> It worked. <laughs> I can say so now. Fake outbox has a, a pending request for a number from one to ten, and over here it's waiting for the response. So in yet another window, I can say bin endo. Uh, I'm going to eval can the we, number forty two. I was going to say, can we give it forty seven? But forty two is good too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so endo lit. Oh wait, I have to do it. I have to. I have to do, create the pet name in the right place. Um, eval in other inbox. The number forty-two. Name it forty-two. And then bin endo. 
in the other in, uh, inbox I'm going to resolve. Request zero with the pet named value 42. And you'll note that my request, I saw the request response come over here on the far left. And if I look over here, uh, without the dash up. Well, in any case, what you can see is that there are no pending, no pending requests on the outbox. It's already been resolved. And with that, that completes what is now possible with the pet demon. And I am ready for Dan's question. Does each of the inboxes and outbox live in a worker? Um, no, the, the inboxes and out, outboxes exist in the memory of the demon itself. Uh, okay. And, but there, there's some kind of, something got scribbled to, to remember them when you reset? Uh, if I restart. Sorry, when you restart. There will still be an other inbox and outbox, but the, the uh, pending requests and response, uh, the pending requests are ephemeral. Those disappear on the restart. Okay. Um, and, and that is potentially something that we'll need to change. That's probably a thing that needs to change, almost certainly a thing that needs to change. Okay, so the when you when the you did a request on the left, where's the promise? In the, uh, the, in the demon, the demon is keeping track of okay. uh, keeping track of the promise. It's memoized in the demon. Um, at the moment, it probably ought to be persisted, and the counter probably needs to be persisted as well. Okay, so all the inboxes and outboxes are in the demon. Okay, and my other question is, how much of this should I expect to run inside the web, in a web browser? Uh, so if you provided an alternate form of persistent, basically, basically in order to get this running inside of a web page, the like the demon itself run you are asking about the demon right do you uh, is the question whether i can get the demon running in a web page or whether you want to be able to interact with the demon from a web page i think the latter okay so interacting with the demon from a web page uh the the web page is going to be talking to the demon over captp over a message port um and it will receive as the the, the remote bootstrap object, an outbox. Um, message port? Yeah, using a, a message port on the web or you know whatever communication channel is necessary in order to stretch a CAPTP connection into a web page. Well, I just repeat what you said, sorry. Yeah, oh, right. This is relevant to Thomas's interests. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah uh, the, my intention is for uh, the protocol from a web page will be that uh, you construct a message port, which is essentially the equi the web's equivalent of a Unix pipe, um, except that it speaks in terms of structured clone uh, of individual, and, and, it, and it frames messages. Um, and, uh, and, and that's literally new message port in, on the web. And that gives you a, a pair, a, a reader and a write side. The idea is that you would then use window.postmessage to send the uh, the other side of the message port into um, to to an extension of the web browser. And then the extension of the web browser would connect the other end of that message port through various machinations to the endo pet demons uh, Unix domain socket. that's it's a it's a multi-stage process to create that connection, but that has been proven out. Um, it uses a combination of Chrome host message protocol and an extension and Chrome messages, <laughs> and then ultimately the message port from the web page. So, so from the the experience from the web auth web page author's point of view is that I we do not need to inject any script into the guest program. It just needs to send a message on via post message to the extension, giving it the, the far end of a message port. And then the program in the web page is responsible for 
uh, creating a CAPTP connection out of the message, the, the, the near side of its message port. And then it can talk to the bootstrap object uh, that, that the endo pet daemon provides for it. Okay, when you say the program and the web page, you're referring to like the extension? No. Or are you saying the actual? We're talking uh, about a web page, literally a web page on the web, anywhere on the web. Okay, yes. But then you were saying, uh, so in order to connect to the endo uh, daemon, you have to send a message to the a plot, an extension, rather. Yes. Right? And then that extension will facilitate sending that message to the end of demon that's correct. yeah you have to go through trampolines um one one way that i've done in the past for example is the page loading a knife frame uh in the context of the extension um and the iframe contacting the background service worker through uh its own uh port already so you can just and then you can pass a port from uh the page all the way to the service worker okay all right, well. And I suppose in Chris's model, like the service worker of the extension then uh, bridges that to the native messaging uh, port that it has uh, with the daemon. Yeah. Um, okay, and then from there. Uh, and, so... and, and for what it's worth, we have code in another prototype for all of that. That's that's something I can pass your way. Yeah, that that, that would be useful, definitely useful uh okay uh, my question was uh, without extensions you know oh. they use http or yeah maybe uh, uh what's the other web messaging thing i've already forgotten uh web rtc no the other one uh web socket uh a web socket yeah uh so for um yeah okay so the other avenue is uh, ne ne never mind from from an open web web page. What about a web page that is opened within the by the pet daemon itself? That isn't that is a design direction that does require a web socket, um, but it also requires a little bit more care to make sure that no one can eavesdrop on the web socket. Um, and for that, there are multiple multiple options. One of which is self signed TLS, which is icky for its own reasons, and then. The other option is to use noise protocol on top of a web socket. And um, why do you why do you have to make sure nobody can sniff to can do what? Well, for a web socket, yeah, you're right. In this per, the the reason in this particular case is vulnerability to other users on a multi-user system. But does that even exist anymore? Good question. Um, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, in a way, it does. Like. Technically, the virus on your computer is a this another user on your multi-user system. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I know that with Agoric SDK, we use a really trivial mechanism to frustrate that kind of attack. Um, we use a bare web socket with an access token. We can probably get away with that in this case too, um, where the initial serve of the web page from the endo daemon would include the access token in the HTML um, or or the resulted bundled application um, and then use that to establish the connection back. And that that I think for the most purposes, for most purposes, frustrates uh, other users on the same system from opening a privileged connection. Um, so there's kind of a bunch of different threat models to think about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, one for each kind of connection. At the end of the day, though, uh, the idea is that we uh, create a we create a communication channel over CAPTP. We and then we provide the far end an outbox, and the outbox is used to identify the origin of uh, is is used to, that we give a pet name to the outbox such that the user can make reasonable decisions about what powers they're granting to whom. Um, yeah, so the, uh, another unsolved piece of that design is, hey, when an arbitrary web page off of the web attempts to create a, con a, a attempt wants to talk to the endo pet daemon, the first thing that has to happen is that the user has to um, be able to, say, uh, to receive a request 
from another layer of the system saying, hey, this is coming from a web page that I've verified its origin and I verified its certificate. Uh, do you want to give a pet name to this peer, essentially, for its outbox? And you sort of have to, uh, we'll have to present to the user an opportunity to give a pet name to um, a page off of the web and give it as, mo as much confidence as we can that they're talking to, um, that they're granting powers to that, uh, to the to, to the web page itself. Uh, yeah. Right. Does anybody put icons inside certificates? Anyway, we do all this cryptography to, to do a bunch of stuff, and then we put up an icon that's completely unrelated, as far as I know. Well, maybe not. Maybe they fetch the icon over the same channel. Uh, what do you mean like the the favico yeah uh, yeah yeah they establish the connection and then just request favico over the tls encrypted connection yeah um so we're down to five minutes that's that's what i've got today um the next step would be, but my uh, there are next next steps are in two directions. Thomas has expressed an interest in putting together uh, um, a spike in the direction of showing a web page, and that's where some of the insights that I got from IPFS come in handy. The idea would be to give uh, to create a uh, to use localhost subdomains for garbledegook.endo.localhost colon some port. And then host a web page on that, a, a confined web page on that, that uh, um, that has a has a uh, that has a designated outbox associated with it, so that we can do the same, have the same interactions with a confined web app. And that would mean that somebody could make a bundle of a thing that's supposed to run in a web page, and that would be granted presumably all of window and document, and not be a multi-tenant web page just for the purposes of being able to have a, any kind of user interface that's able to talk to the pet daemon over a web socket. Um, and there are, again, a number of directions to go in that yeah, to, for that, but my, my intuition is that for the purposes of a spike, the easiest way to get there is to just say, use the, reuse the existing me mechanism for bundling and say that the only web pages that we're going to be interested in hosting are the ones that are pure JavaScript for now. Um, and then they just have to use the DOM API in order to realize their UI, um, which I know sucks in the long term, but uh, uh, is an intermediate step we can use to prove out the idea. And then, um, have yeah. Have you thought about the, the sort of web forms equivalent of these endo follow and request and answer yes. or resolve methods? Yes, I in the demo I did maybe a year ago in October, I had put together a really, really skeletal version of this. The intention of the design of the inbox API is to specifically to make it possible for um, for uh, the the primary use case for this web page would be to create a permission management, an inbox web app, um, which where in which case that we would be passing the inbox as the outbox to the web app and then it would use the inbox to sort of like query the uh, query pending requests and it receives an async iterator for pending requests so it can react Wait, to, what would it look like uh, a probably a tree possibly a chat uh, something like that gotcha. um, i'm expecting that the user interface will need to have some combination of facilities for task management like killing runaway killing runaway workers, um, monitoring the health, like a task manager effectively on one hand, but then also a pet, uh, but primarily yes, pet name management. So it'll have to have a list of all of your pet names, a way to drill into them and inspect what they are. Um, it might need a REPL so that you can issue these eval commands if you want to do it, The if you want to play the power user game. Um, and it might, uh, and but for the request, uh, yeah, the the um, looking at the inbox, it's probably most closely resembles chat. 
I I find the the inbox outbox terminology very confusing. Yeah, I don't like it either. Um, I started with inbox and power box, but then someone told me that power box was a description of the whole thing and not the not, not the narrow well, thing. The 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 the, 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 the there. there it, it kind of reminds me of um, the time I was refactoring a bunch of uh, uh, video conferencing networking stuff. And part of the problem is that the one party's input is another party's output. But also each of these, even though they're called inboxes and outboxes, they're things that things other things go into and come out of. And so um, there's sort of a there's sort of an in and out and a meta in and a meta out, and using in and out as the labels for at both layers is um, extra confusing. Yes, and it gets even worse when it probably turns out in the fullness of time that the inbox and outbox also have symmetric APIs. That that'll that'll be fun. It's possible that they're the same type. Um, yeah, and, and 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 well, they could be the same type, but but differentiated in terms of the role they're playing in a particular dialogue. But then you then you then you have to come up with a name for those roles. Uh, but if if there were terminology that um, didn't have sort of baked in directionality to it, but was more about what it, what it, what is the the task that this thing is attempting to accomplish? I think it might be clearer. Is so I'm kind of new this to this game, and I assume that because I'm playing. What what I'm trying to do is re is create a thing that has existed before. I assume these things have other names <laughs> that this problem has been solved before. I'm, well, two things. One is I'm not sure that that's true. Second of all, to the extent that people have solved it, it doesn't necessarily mean they've solved it well. <laughs> um, and so, um, um, you know, so you you can you can aspire to do better than your predecessors. Um, uh, uh, but, yeah, I, I too was born of hubris. I, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I, what, what I'm trying to get at is that if you know a precedent that you like, I'm all ears. Um, otherwise, I just have to jam on this some more. Yeah, uh, no, I, I don't. If I had some obvious, oh, you should call them, you know, X and Y, I would have immediately jumped in. But, but right. And it, this also brings me to the point that I've missed my opportunity since I held a whole hour to talk about this. And I knew that I needed to ask Mark what a caplet was and whether what an endo pet demon extension is, is a caplet. Um, but I imagine that's another conversation. And, and also, even if caplet is the right word for it, would I want to reuse something that's mired in a metaphor from the 90s? Well, there's this sort of, you know, old things are new again. You can you know, deliberately yeah, play maybe. a retro angle. On the other hand, something that was popular back when um, is different from something that was a failure back when. So, uh, I mean, yeah. applets were a distinct failure. Caplets were riff riffing on the name applet. And everybody knows that applets were a failure, and therefore caplets yeah. must have been too, right? Right. Uh, yeah, even though, exactly. in fact, they were never really a thing. Except for, of course, that applets also barely were ever a thing either. And I, and it's come like it's been long enough that people are starting to forget. Like, how many people know John Resig? <laughs> it's just. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember at the time when applets were starting to be discussed and Janice, who is from the Pacific Northwest, was very, very confused because um, in some part of Washington or Oregon or somewhere, there are applets and cotlets, which are these fruit, dried fruit products that, that um, um, come from some company that makes them. Um, and. Uh, and so she found the whole word applet very confusing. And uh, I was tempted to introduce cotlet as a technical term just to amplify the confusion, but I never oh, my, that's an appropriate wonderful. time to inject it. Yeah, that makes me think that I probably should go and make this even more confusing. I could call them epaulets. 
and there's also the, the Capulets who who could um <laughs> yeah and Montagues that right. just get our way like really really far from the source <laughs> and until we find one that sounds like it's sufficiently distant from both a usable metaphor and enlightenment <laughs> um yeah I mean okay. I, I, I well I mean there's a there's a, a uh, famous line from I think it was Dwight Eisenhower um he said sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to make it bigger oh jeez <laughs> which is which oh, is my. which is to say that 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 if you if you expand the scope a little bit then you have a bunch of general cases that all you know special cases that all collapse together into a general case and like well there you go yeah and i can imagine why eisenhower would like general cases a lot more than anything else <laughs> No, general cases, general Eisenhower. No, okay. I, I get it now, but it definitely went over my head at first. Yeah. That's not my. That's not my uh, area. I I like. Oh, it. Uh, All right, okay. that's funny uh, yeah. because that means that Eisenhower is like almost a perfect duel for that. He has a quote that's almost the perfect duel of the, um, the oftenly misattributed, um. What is it? Quantity is its own quality. Quantity has a quality all its own. Yeah, um, which, which was, was evidently Stalin. Yes. Or, <laughs> or yes, it's the kind of thing that's attributed to Stalin. <laughs> right. Uh, not actually that clever. Yeah, that's a yep. OK, so uh, Thomas, um, I have a few more minutes if you want to ask me concrete questions about next steps for a project of you're going on a spike. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that would be great. Um, so you mentioned that there's already, like it seems like uh, the extension route might be, do you think that that's the best? That's not, that's not the extent, that's not the, that is one of many angles that need to be explored. Um, I implemented enough so michael fig pointed me in the direction of building the, the extension and i have a branch in another repository the exo repository that i look i looked at that over the, that the first time i've ever checked that out actually was over the weekend and then i pulled down the yeah, branch of yours like uh from maybe seven months ago it's been a while um yeah that sounds about right that branch of mine contains the code for an endo extension, and the endo extension um, has a prototype for that entire communication chain. Some of that has already been consolidated into the endo repository pro proper, but never reconstructed from the consolidation. So if you look in the endo repository, you'll find an LP32 package. That's the length, that's the that's the yeah. host message protocols um communication like message framing protocol um that length prefix 32 lp32 is the name of the package and that's that's the protocol that a chrome native messaging host uses to speak um okay. yeah to speak to chrome basically <laughs> so what happens is that uh you if you arrange for a native ho me native messaging host to be installed and given per and and have given a specific per uh um extension the ability to use it what will happen is that when the extension reaches out to your message host it will speak to that message host on standard io using the lp32 protocol and the LP, endo LP32 adapts that into an asynchronous iterator of messages out of which you can create a CAPTP connection. Okay. Now, would I be communicating to, uh, like from... Okay. So is this only for the CAPTP connection, I'm wondering, or... Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, we only used it to, to stretch CAPTP between an extension and the daemon okay so let me look all right so and one, then one, so, yeah. one thing that is done incorrectly 
in that prototype is that the native messaging host was a simple trampoline. It was just ferrying messages to the Unix domain socket. So what happened was that the web page was communicating directly to the endo daemon's user facet, which would be a huge security liability. <laughs> what needs oh. to actually happen is that the um, the native message host needs to arrange, needs to communicate, it needs to terminate a CAPTP connection and then create a separate CAPTP connection to the endo pet daemon and then mediate that interaction. So it would be the native, mes native messaging host's responsibility to identify and um, and verify the integrity of the um, of the caller of the native message host, and then oh. and then present a message to the pet daemon with an API that does not yet exist. Okay, so I'm gonna have to play. Are we still recording? Because I, I I am gonna have yeah yeah yeah. yeah all right yeah I'm cool. I'm gonna have, definitely have to re-listen to this. So uh, yeah, similar to how in the demon uh, in the test file, you know it, it you know it cancels whatever or maybe closes any existing connections, mm -hmm. and then it calls get bootstrap, mm -hmm. uh, which is creating that cap TP connection. Correct. Yeah. So that would be a, yeah, a similar process to what would be going on within this extension. Mm -hmm. Yes. And okay, cool. Yeah. So specifically the native message host would have a CAPTP connection to the browser and a CAPTP connection to the Unix domain socket for the endo pet daemon. The bootstrap on the browser side is one protocol. And the bootstrap on the daemon side is a highly privileged user-facing protocol. So what needs to happen is that when you're in this position, you need to be, you would need to be in a position to say to, to send a message to the user through the root inbox of the daemon saying, hey, there's this party that wants to communicate with you. Do you want to accept that connection or not? And if you do, what pet deem, what pet name do you want to give it? And that would take the form presumably of a request of some kind. Um, and that request, that request type, I don't think really, that message type doesn't exist yet. Um, uh, okay. it, we, we, it would be like an introduction request. Oh, okay, okay. And then this is, you know, once accepted, like after that is when it would come because I really liked just kind of the analogy of like a permission manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, this is asking the user, hey, do you want to establish this connection? And then once that connection is established, then it can start acting like that permission manager. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And, yeah. So and, and it's, right. It's, and it and and as a consequence, if the user accepts it. Uh, accepts the invitation and creates a pet name for the outbox. The outbox would be uh, the the reference to the outbox would be passed back to the web page, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that would all be done through this plugin through like through the native host, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess one question while I have you. Uh, so wait, where does L30? So L30P comes in here. Well, like where exactly? So yeah, the uh, in order to communicate, right? The native message host is a program that the web browser will shell out to. Okay. If and extension asks for a connection over the native messaging host, right? So the extension has to say, I want to connect to this native message host. And there's an API, a Chrome, uh, a Chrome extension API that allows you to do that. I don't remember what it is, but it's written down in that pull request <laughs> or in that branch as it were. Um, and what that does is it tells the browser, okay, I'm going to create essentially um, a Chrome extension stream on one side, and I'm going to shell out to the program that was designated as the message host. And then 
um, communicate with the, 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 and then communicate on standard IO with the message, with the message host sub program using length prefixed 32 bit length prefixed message frames, right? So it's a binary protocol in terms of a little endian 32 bit integer describing the length of the message followed by the message bytes and the LP32 package implements that protocol and provides a high level J JavaScript asynchronous iterator of messages as its API. Um, and you need to create a pair of these, one for sending and one for receiving. There's a reader and a writer. Okay, all right, awesome. Well, this is definitely enough information for now. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so that's just one down one direction and that's probably yeah like if you want to own that direction for a week <laughs> that's perfectly fine I mean, that's not the direction you, i'm going to run down yeah i mean what so uh yeah if you it, it, it this seems i'm wondering if it could be done uh like if there's a different connection uh like, is that the only way to use WebSockets to... The web, that's not even a WebSocket. No WebSockets are involved. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. With the post message, that made uh -huh. me think. But, uh -huh. uh, all right, so is there uh, is there a route where... Because it seems like we, we almost have all the tools to yeah. handle this without an extension. Um, uh, so without an extension is interesting um so there's a different so so that's one design route that's just one design route it's one we would need to do if we want to make this project interesting to metamask right okay down the other avenue is what is the permission management ui going to be for endo at the moment it's at the command line but that's not going to last <laughs> that's not that's clearly not the long-term solution and really what I think of the endopet daemon as is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer web browser with this off the, with this hardened JavaScript executor um, that communicates with eventual send, right? It's like all of those things. It's about object capabilities, distributed web applications, and uh, instead of, uh, and having an alternate di distribution model for programs that are viewed by the user, right? So the distribution model for endo for a web for for an endo extension, whatever we end up calling it, a caplet, whatever, it's it is a web page functionally. It's a web page that communicates with a permission management API over some protocol or another. And um in order to be able to connect itself to the other distributed web applications out there. Um and uh one of the options for bringing those programs into end user computers is to literally build an electron application that just doesn't have a url bar um in which case every uh, you would just be running a web view inside of a window for every distributed web application where the title is effectively the pet name of uh of the contained application no navigation ui at all um that's that's sort of like the long-term vision that you you basically have a permission management a API and you can send applications to friends peer-to-peer -peer as bundles, like the 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 zip zip archive containing all of the parts necessary to make the web page somewhere else. Um and possibly including a back reference to your backend API that's running on some other endopet daemon, right? Um okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, 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 so, all right, uh, two things. So, uh, in Exo, so I definitely want to make myself more familiar with the work that went on over there. Uh, I guess maybe after this, we can just, uh, I can uh, clarify, you know, we can uh, figure out, or rather, uh, determine whether or not the branch I have is the correct one, you know, uh, that I'm yeah. looking at. So we've talked about two. We're not even on the one that I think is low hanging. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> those are the uh, long term. Those are two directions we can go in the long term, like branching out to a, an extension of a web browser, having a full on electron shell application, 
The third option that I would like to investigate in the short term is easy in comparison. Okay. And yeah, for, for what it's worth too, uh, the two options we uh, just discussed, although, yeah, I'll have to re- rewatch them a bunch, re-listen a lot. It makes sense, you know, it, it does make sense uh, yeah. at a high level. Yeah. But let's let's hear the, the this yes, straightforward. Well, the uh, low-hanging one is let's piggyback on the user's existing web browser. There's an NPM package called Open, and open is a, a cross-platform alternative to the open command that exists on a Mac. I don't know if you're familiar with this one or not, but basically it's like just open a web page in whatever web browser you can find. Um, and okay. it works on Linux, it works on Windows, it works on Mac. Um, and which is important. Yes. <laughs> and what it means is that what we could do is surface a, a function on the outbox or the inbox or both with different different arrangements um, called open that opens a web page um, on, on behalf of, a, of another third party with a particular web front end program and a reference to its corresponding back end, right? So what that would mean is uh, MetaMask, for example, could use the outbox it receives from the pet daemon through that other protocol that we talked about through the extension and say, hey, I want to open a web page and I want to open a web page with this bundle I'm giving you. And I want to I want to hold its uh I want to hold its backend API reference. So the extension would be uh the extension the, the MetaMask itself would host the backend API for this web application. And then open a web page through the pet daemon that is hosted by the pet daemon that mediates the connection all the way back to the extension. Okay, so so uh, we're giving uh, so the user is giving a bundle or maybe giving a pet name that maps to a bundle. Let's that, let's use let's instead of user let's say let's say MetaMask. Okay, MetaMask. All right, so MetaMask is giving. Uh, uh, okay, okay. MetaMask is using uh, the open formula. Is open a formula in this? The open function would generate a formula. Yes. It also okay. generates a request to the user asking permission to open a window. Okay. That the user must press, must grant. And when they grant and when they grant it in the endo user interface, then it then the daemon would open a window, another window in a web in any in, in whatever web uh web web browser is available to it. That it would then okay. host that bundle on a local on a local host subdomain, which is to say that the pet pet daemon would run a web server on another port, and be able to open web browser windows to subdomains of that web page of, of that web browser and use virtual hosts um, in order to de- in, in order to um, uh, in order to decide which bundle to serve the web page. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, yeah, I was w- wondering about if... Uh, um, okay, if Endo uh, asks MetaMask, you know, requests permission to open a web page, if after that it asked which bundle would you... or, or if that would all be bundled bundled together uh yeah the or, open, so so yeah. all of the inbox outbox commands are framed and in, in terms of pet names so there would basically be it would basically be a multi-part um or oh, i don't know it might there there's some fiddling to do but basically the metamask would have to provide a bundle by calling like outbox.store and then give okay. it a giant uh, give it an async iterator of base64 encoded data or something like that. So basically save a file in your content address store with this text, right? 
that the user may inspect, right? That has to be mm -hmm. formed in a way that makes it easy for the user to inspect the application for auditing purposes, right? Um, and then also uh, um, give it this API object. So MetaMask would have to arrange for two two formulas: one for one formula to pr produce the content of the bundle, and another formula to produce the the backend API for it. And there are there are a number of ways it might want to do that, but the simplest and most obvious is like, here's my API. Use uh, when when we're connected. Use this object. Okay. And, and some of these what, questions are have un, there are unanswered questions in this design. <laughs> what would the backend API look like? Uh, Ever MetaMask chooses right because it's a contract between the front end and the back end, and MetaMask uh, is providing both. Okay, and is that like what powers we need in order to operate um, in order for the backend API. So that could be arranged separately, right? Um, the, the MetaMask could say that in order to do this, I need access to these additional powers. As it happens, MetaMask already has all of the powers it needs to do its job, except for the ability to execute something on the host's machine, on the user's machine. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, another yeah. another user story might be the other way around, that because this is ultimately a snap story. Maybe MetaMask isn't the party that's opening the snap. It could be the other way around, where you could browse to a web page for the publisher of a snap, and they say they reach out through the post message mechanism I described earlier, saying, "Hey, I would like to." Uh, it could say, do the something similar, say, please open this bundle that contains my snap and please give it access to the MetaMask API um, or vice versa. You could say when this web, when you open that web application in a web page, it could ask the user for access to the MetaMask API. Either way, the MetaMask introduces itself with its API object um, and, uh, and the snap Thanks. requests access to it. Okay, um, so kind of basic here. All right, so I guess from all this, I'm, I I can take away that this is a dynamic, you know, the end goal, like there's there's no fixed way to get to this end goal. Um, so yeah, creativity is accepted uh, <laughs> and allowed. Uh, so when you're, uh, uh, so let's say that this web page uh geez um so in order just to serve static html what powers uh do you need powers yeah. great question uh, well, yeah. there, there are there are a couple of ways to do this um and i intend to explore both um the first uh the first angle we could pursue is say um, uh, the outbox needs a store function. It needs it needs the outbox needs more of the current inbox API. Except the only and the only difference between the outbox API and the inbox API is the the outbox. Anytime you call one of the functions on the outbox, involves sending a message to the user asking for permission to actually do the thing, right? So store uh, on an outbox API, the store function would be the same as the inbox store function, except that the user has to say yes. All right, and it and the way okay. the user says yes is by designating a pet name for the or for um for 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 the object that it's storing, right? Um uh, yeah, for the object that's being requested. Yeah, for the object that it's storing that's being requested. Yeah. yeah. And that workflow doesn't exist yet. We need a store function in the daemon. We need an open function in the daemon. Now, the inbox open would be would would not require user permission, but on the outbox side, it would be the exact same function, except it's like take the uh, designate a bundle, designate a, an outbox, and then arrange for that web page to to be opened in a web browser on the user's machine, and um, and, and then in the from the outbox perspective, then the user would receive a message saying, hey, this party with this outbox name 
is requesting that to wants to open a web page with this content and these powers or with this power box as it were um okay then uh then how that happens could be one of two possible there could be two different kinds of bundle basically on one hand you could say here that that you could the the user could offer a zip file that contains the static assets that you want to run on that host right in which okay. case the web hosting side is really easy it's just like whatever the url is go to the corresponding entry in the zip file and provide the content with a reasonable with a course reasonable corresponding content type that's probably the hardest part of the problem is the is configuring it with the right content types for the contents of a zip file since zip files don't tell you that it's just a convention based off of the extension and that that is enough to make me leery of that approach there are too many unsolved problems but it also gives the user so much it gives the end application the most freedom um and then in that case, they would be responsible for creating their own WebSocket and then and authenticating that WebSocket. And that that's another set of problems that I don't want to delve into quite yet. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking we table that idea. It's obviously needed in the long term, but it's got too many unanswered questions. Okay. Alternate. I... Here's another yes. approach. Um, on every single virtual domain, we serve the exact same content. It's an end. Oh, I have to go. I have another meeting. All but right. The okay. idea is that we gen we create an index HTML and an index.js that we have bundled using Endo, using the Endo bundler. The behavior of the JavaScript is to establish a CAPTP connection over WebSocket to the same origin. Um and okay. and all it does is provide a bootstrap object with the API necessary to receive another bundle of behavior, which it would endow with the document and window of the page. Um, okay. So there would be like a lot, so it would be like a JavaScript only interface. It's like all, it's like, congratulations, you're now executing an arbitrary existing JavaScript program that has been bundled using the existing bundling technology we have. And it's simply endowed with document and window so it can do basically anything it want within the confines of the same origin policy that means that the web server needs to be really really careful to forbid across origin script requests <laughs> with as, as just it right okay anyway, okay got to yeah, run all right, all right. we'll talk but thank you yeah. thank you yeah, yeah. later